Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today for this <clears throat> event titled Navigating the Evolving Opioid Crisis. Uh, my name is Ryan Streeter. I'm the Director of Domestic Policy Studies here, and I'm um, pleased to be able to welcome Congressman Greg uh, Walden here with us today to talk about this um, with AEI resident scholar Sally Sattel. Um, Congressman Walden is the U.S. Representative for the 2nd Congressional District in Oregon, and he's the Republican leader of the House uh, Energy and Commerce Committee, um, where he's developed quite a reputation for drawing policymakers' attention to this issue. And so uh, there's no, no better person uh, in Congress to be here talking with us about this today. <clears throat> he's worked uh, to pass legislation to promote uh, opioid recovery and treatment for patients and communities in this role. And also in this role, he's worked to spur new technology and innovation and grow American jobs by expanding access to um, wire wireless broadband. Um, before his time in Congress, um, Congressman Walden spent more than two decades as a radio station owner in Oregon. Um, Sally Sattel is a resident scholar at AEI and the staff psychiatrist at Partners in Drug Abuse, Rehabilitation, and Counseling. She's also currently uh, living in southeastern Ohio where she's doing field work on the opioid epidemic. Um, on um, and before uh, coming to AI years ago, she was an assistant professor of psychiatry at, at Yale University. In addition to her many articles and essays, Dr. Sattel is the author of a number of books, including Drug Treatment, The Case for Coercion, One Nation Under Therapy, The Health Disparity Myth, and Brainwash, The Seductive Appeal of Mindless Neuroscience. So please join me um, in welcoming uh, Congressman Walden and Dr. Sattel. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming. and. And, and you, representative, yes. In fact, we were here November uh, 13th, 2017, and talking about this uh, the crisis at that point. And um, at that time, there were about um, at least two major pieces of legislation that had been passed. One was the uh, was CARA, Comprehensive Addiction Rehabilitation Act, or excuse me, Recovery Act. Uh, which was authorized <clears throat> until 20, 2020. And the other bigger one was the Cures Act, the 20th Century Cures Act, right? And that's about, um, about half a million a year for two years, but then 3.3 .3 billion were added, very necessarily. Uh, and, but now, almost uh, a year and a half later, um, we are up to uh, a new large, very large, very impressive, very comprehensive, and very sweeping piece of legislation called uh, the SUPPORT Act. I'll tell you what the acronym stands for, and then I'm going to ask you, Representative, to talk about uh, some of the most important provisions of that in your view. But SUPPORT stands for uh, su um, the Substance Use Disorder Prevention that Promotes Opioid Recovery and Treatment for Patients and Communities Act. So that's a big one. And um, <clears throat> it's many thousands, I believe, pages. And, but within those pages, which are the provisions that, that, that you feel are the most important? Well, doctor, thank you, first of all, for your leadership on this issue and, and for having me back. Because um, it all did kind of kick off here, I think, as, as we started this. Support Act was a, a bipartisan bill. Um, in the end, we took uh, 57 different pieces of legislation that passed the committee on the House floor unanimously, rolled them up into one called the Support Act, because as it turns out the Senate probably can't take up 57 different pieces of legislation, um, and we knew that. We had enormous bipartisan uh, participation in this problem because this is an epidemic that may hit West Virginia, uh, it may hit New Hampshire, it certainly hit Oregon, it hits everywhere, and it crosses every socioeconomic uh, line. And so um, I think there are a couple things that are, are really important in here. Um, one is we gave the FDA some new authority um, to require drug makers to um, identify the, the long-term uh, appropriate use of these uh, opioid drugs and their effectiveness. They didn't have that authority before. And I think yesterday Dr. Scott Gottlieb said he's moving forward with that. We, we did a long-term investigation here. On, uh, on the issues involving opioids and what went wrong. Uh, we can get into those recommendations mm -hmm. later. But I think accessing more treatment in our communities, doing more to shut down the illegal importation of fentanyls and opioids. Um, and I think probably the biggest thing, whether it's a specific or not in the bill, 
is the education of members of Congress and the public that this is a disease known as an addiction related to something that, frankly, many cases, unfortunately and tragically, started with a prescription. Can't tell you how many families I've met with who said their child started with a high school football injury, um, got on opioids, and became highly addicted. And the transformation was from there to heroin. The heroin had to get more and more potent, and that included fentanyl, and it's either led to death or a destroyed life. So we're dealing with, with yeah. each phase of this the law enforcement phase, the interdiction phase, the treatment phase. Yeah, I've always felt that the Frankly, the, the quaint old supply and demand reduction dichotomy is, is still one of the right. best organizing principles. And in, in this uh, situation, you have from the supply, we're used to having illicit supply, and we're certainly working on that. But, uh, but this time around, it's very much illicit supply as well, which is to say prescription medicine, e even though, as I, I talk about this a lot, and I always, I always emphasize that the majority of, of abused prescription opioids are, are, are not the patients for whom it's prescribed, but, but certainly people for whom it's prescribed can get in trouble, and they're usually a, the subset of, of patients who either have a, a history of substance abuse, alcoholism, or they're struggling with some sort of mental disorder or something. Now, in the case of kids, because um, someone has to start somewhere, right? You don't have that much of a history when you're 16. Uh, it, it's a especially complicated situation because um, uh, frequently when a, when a kid who's involved with sports or something gets injured, then a lot of times their whole life seems to unravel. That was their identity. That was their social network. And these drugs are very good at medicating that kind of distress. So they keep using. Back to the legislation. Um, so every beloved legislation still has its little orphans that were cut out. Um, so what, what didn't make it that, that you still are there, hope to pursue? I think there are two issues at a minimum. One was the legislation that uh, Representative John Katko really led on, SISTA, that dealt with um, how these uh, illicit drug uh, makers, you, the <laughs> distributors, whatever, um, will change a molecule and suddenly it's not illegal to have this substance. In China, you mean the illicit drug? Well, yes. Yeah. And, and so you get the illegal fentanyls, the synthetics mm -hmm. that come in. Mm -hmm. And, and our, our current way to deal with that does not adjust as fast as those chemists yeah. who change out the list. And, um, and that's something we've got to address. Yeah. Passed in the House, I uh, got dropped out in the Senate. Hmm. Um, and then there's the, the part two. 45 mm -hmm. CFR Part 2, this is where prior to HIPAA, <clears throat> there was legislation passed to gain, to provide uh, privacy for those that are in substance uh, use uh, uh, disorder mm -hmm. uh, and getting treatment. Mm -hmm. And that's all fine. And they should. Because you don't ever want that to be used against a person for employment or housing or anything else. HIPAA comes along, though, and now you've got two doc doctrines. And we tried to harmonize that because there are cases now where people who are getting treated for their substance use disorder, the information about what they're taking is not a easily able to transfer strictly for medical purposes across the line, and we have had deaths as a result. And when I was doing roundtables in my district, when we were hearing from people around the country, the provider community said that's one of the most important things you can do. It's 45 CFR Part 2. And, and people tell me, oh, you don't want to take that on. That's got uh, all these issues. Well, we took it on. And we passed it. And I, somebody can correct me, but I think there were only like 40 or 50 no votes on the House floor when we finally got it there. Um, because people, once they understood that we had actually stronger protections for privacy for the patient than even HIPAA, but we allowed for the transfer of information for medical-only purposes to avoid uh, a bad drug interaction that could be fatal and has been fatal, People go, oh, okay. If they took the time to understand it, yeah. they supported it. And, and we won big on the House floor. Tragically, in the Senate, it, it fell out because there was a couple of senators that had a different view or hadn't done their research. Um, and so I hope we can come back and, and tackle that. So 45 CFR and, and SESTA would yeah. be two that I think should be at the forefront of legislative initiative in the very near future. 
Yeah, that, that second, uh, the CFR that you mentioned, the privacy is so important because when you're, you know, you're a doctor, someone comes in with a painful condition and, and you are considering opioids, and I should say there's a lot more sensitivity now to be using them as a, as a first um, agent, but nevertheless, these drugs are effective and they are very good when they're, I feel strongly about that as a doc, you know, when they're used properly. But you want to know if a, pay, if a person had a problem with addiction before. It doesn't mean you won't prescribe it, but it means you might prescribe fewer at any one time. Uh, again, we're doing that as well. But uh, that's very important information, and, uh, um, and it, it needs to be known. So, And then your committee did... Um, you're involved with several investigations, and um, can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, you know, we did a, our team did a really good job investigating the opioid epidemic. Um, 300 I pages, I mean, this is one exhaustive. Pages. Oh. Um, I read every one. <laughs> I'm an old journalism major, so I drive my staff crazy when I go and make little edits. Uh, but they did a terrific job, and, and, and I know you're going to hear from the mayor of, of Huntington, West Virginia, but West Virginia, tragically, was a poster child. And a case study is what this is of what went wrong there because it didn't go that wrong anywhere else. It went wrong everywhere else, but nowhere did it go. was it worse than West Virginia. And, you know, we've got some recommendations out of that uh, that the Congress should look at. But it's across the board. You know, the DEA, and, and I think they've announced now they're going to make their Arcos data mm -hmm. uh, more readily available. I literally was in the face of the then Attorney General Jeff Sessions at the White House saying, you're about to become the recipient of my first subpoena as chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee. He said, well, what's that about? And I said, we're trying to get your Arcos data from DEA so we can find out what in the heck is going on. And so they kind of fussed around a little bit and said, well, don't do that. Let us work with you. And so they, they, then they gave us a little data, but not much. I remember that last time that came up. So then I went to Don McGahn, who I've known for 20 years, and I said, Don, I, I'm serious. You guys are going to get a subpoena if we don't get this data. And we're not here to do, we're, we're trying to get to the bottom of the problem. And he said, got it. I'm on it. And then we got access to the data. Now, the DEA, God bless them has decided making this information more available to the distributors and all may actually help. So, so we're, we're on a better path. It was hard break on the old paradigm, though. Um, and I, I didn't have to issue that subpoena, which could have gotten real interesting, um, since you'd issue it to this, you know, the Attorney General of the United States. That could get interesting. I'm not a lawyer. I've stayed in the Holiday Inn a few times, so I practice <laughs> law. Um, but the long and the short of it is, I think, getting those data out there and using them, because what we found was the Arcos data was a blinking red light about what was happening, and it was being ignored. The DEA didn't do their job uh, using their, their stop orders um, uh, as much as they should have. And, and there were reasons, but they weren't the right reasons. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and the distributors should have seen this coming. They should have seen this in the data as well. And they did, some of them, and acted. Some of them acquired operations and then discovered what had been going on and shut it down. And the FDA, back in 2001, you know, said, yeah, this stuff's probably fine. But they didn't have the authority to look at the long-term effectiveness. And so there was, a, there was a whole, you know, and, and Congress, I'm sure, is to blame here, too. And, and, and we as citizens said nobody should be in pain. I had an oncologist talk to me. He said, I'm old enough to remember going to continuing education when they told us nobody sh it's malpractice for a patient to leave in pain with these new medications. And so our whole culture drove us to this. Our institutions failed us along the way. And, 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 and we've come in now and realized the mistakes of the past. And I think we've got a good body of law here. Now we need to continue oversight, see what works and what doesn't. We need to pick up these pieces I've talked about. But this... Seldom in this job do you get to say you're going to save lives. And uh, I think this legislation will save lives. It's, it will take a while to turn this as the addictive nature of these, these drugs. 
Yeah, this is a phenomenal report. I didn't read every page of it. Just the first. You've got until Just tomorrow. the first three hundred, obviously. But uh, anyway, it's uh, it's incredibly detailed, and 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 the uh, the lapses in the system are pretty egregious. You know, bringing seven million pills into a town with four people and an arthritic dog. I mean, it's just. Yeah. The dog so, was really arthritic. Yeah, he needed the pain. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> the the other one was where they set up. This was, I think, one of the either CBS or somebody had a, a story where they had set up a hot dog stand because the lines were so long the day that the prescriptions would come out for opioids yeah. at one of these pharmacies. So somebody, an entrepreneur, gotta love America, yeah. <laughs> set up a hot dog stand. So while people were waiting in line to get these probably fraudulent prescriptions. Yeah, and how much also was diverted from distributors um, is a something lot. I don't think people are quite realize. They think it all came out of medicine chests, but it didn't. It, Everywhere. Probably the most of it, and pill mills. Um, and, there's, and another investigation you did on patient brokering, right? Yeah, and this is, so this is an ongoing one that, that I hope uh, Chairman Pallone will, will pick up on. And this is where, um, yeah, the patient brokering issue where, where patients um, are, are, you basically get paid to get into a program and then they drain your insurance or whatever and then they kick you out the back door and then there may be somebody there that can solve your addiction problem with more opioids. And it's, it's an evil, evil enterprise. And we didn't, I mean, we've been working yeah. on that, but that's one that needs to, to yeah, go forward. Yeah, I remember that came up too last time. Yeah. Um, so we're, as you know, we're following this discussion with a panel of folks who are on the ground, a mayor of a town that um, came to really tragic attention in August of 2016 with, I think, 26 people overdosed. Luckily, only two, you know, died. But. And, um, and also um, a, a doctor who was the um, director of Medicaid in, or in Missouri and knows a lot about states. But, but uh, you know, one of the problems is that a, a lot of localities aren't aware of the services that the, and, and funding that is available mm. from the feds. And, uh, and I know you're, I think the bill does something to address that as it well. It does. It's called the Info Act. Bob Latta from Ohio really pushed that. But... Nobody was in my ear more than David McKinley about this, by the way. I heard from him all the time. There's all this money we pass in Congress, and how do people at home ever know what to do, where to go, and how to get it? Mm -hmm. They don't even know how to apply for it. So basically what Bob's bill does is create a, require the government to create a dashboard where small communities can go online and say, oh, here's the panoply of, <coughs> of opportunities to get help for our communities. And I think once implemented, that will be a real common sense, basic tool but so valuable to a small community. I mean, I, I represent the second district of Oregon. It was stretched from Ohio to the Atlantic Ocean. Bigger than any state east of the Mississippi, other than Michigan, if you include the whole lake. Um, I have to tell Fred Upton that. I know, <laughs> Michigan's bigger. Um, and, and so you have these very small rural communities. And, and this is a, uh, an addiction and threat to the lives of people in every community, regardless of size. But if you're in a big metropolitan area, you probably got 500 people working on this. If you're in a small town of Fossil, Oregon, with 400 people, <clears throat> you don't, you know, you're just trying to keep the lights on. And so I think this will be very helpful. That's good. Um, so my last question before we open this up to, to everyone else is, um, as you probably know, and I certainly speak from my firsthand observation in um, this little town in, in Ohio, it's called Ironton. In fact, it's part of the tri-state area of Kentucky, West Virginia, um, where this is how I know Mayor Williams, and um, Ashland, Kentucky. And now <laughs> there and other places as well, methamphetamine is, yes. is uh, coming up in um, not so much the mom and pop methadone anymore, I mean methamphetamine, <clears throat> but the Breaking Bad quality methamphetamine from, from Mexico. And it's either in some places, and there's so much geographic variation, it's really surprising, mm -hmm. but and so in some places it's almost displacing opioids, and in other places it's kind of superimposed on it. And I've thought, Personally, we should almost stop thinking about putting words in front of epidemic and calling it an addiction epidemic. I'm, I'm glad you said that because <clears throat> nobody put a sharper point on this than Bobby Rush. And he said, you know, you all are dealing with this opioid epidemic. In the communities I represent, we saw that as a crack cocaine epidemic. But nobody saw it as an epidemic. You saw it as a criminal offense. 
And I said, you know, it was one of those moments, that's the greatest thing about Congress, the diversity of opinion, the diversity of our country. And I looked at Bobby and I said, you know what, you're right. So while we talk about H.R. 6 as an opioid bill, we changed it because of Bobby Rush mm -hmm. to make it about oh, addiction. Yeah. And so we get, you know, it still talks about opioids. In my district, in, in round tables I, I held, and I did a lot of them, I had sheriffs and local mental health uh, folks and, and everybody in the community. And in some communities it was, it was meth. Um, some communities it was opioids. It was always kind of opioids, but some it was more meth. They'd say, oh, that's... And then I've had others, experts, and I appreciate your views on this, that there's actually sort of a sine wave. Oh, yeah. Um, from from depressants to yeah, we yeah. Could have told you this was coming. Yeah, it's predictive um, almost. It's it's tragic. Now in meth, our state really led. Uh, I did a bunch of roundtables way back when. I, it was kind of fun. I had the DEA head and some others, and then I I put on stage everything that goes into the making of meth: battery acid, all this stuff. And I said, who gets up in the morning and says, "Hey, I think I'll have a little," and and we had big turnouts, and and the state put the uh, Oh, the, the, the uh, uh, what's the? Ephedrine? Pseudo ephedrine. Ephedrine. Pseudoephedrine behind the counter. So it's basically a prescription in Oregon. And that shut down yeah, the mom and pop yeah. operations of making it in hotel rooms and cars and back in the woods or whatever. But to your point, it just now comes in higher grade from, from across yeah. the border. And guess what? There's no medication for this one. No. And um, my personal view is that this is where drug courts become even more important. Great. And there's a wonderful model, um, for actually from uh, Hawaii, where um, their drug court was pretty much 100% methamphetamine, and they had excellent results. We, we have two in Oregon. We've had very successful results on drug court. In fact, a judge has just retired. <clears throat> um, I attended a couple of graduation or met with some of the, the, the young people, and they focused on pregnant moms. The fact that if you could intercede at the right time, not only did you save that woman's life, but you could head off a million dollar uh, baby uh, from having all the effects if, if you got yeah. involved and broke the cycle uh, and being born so you know addicted um, and, and, and just change a life. And uh, so they really focused on, on moms mm -hmm. um, and, and had some really positive results. I, I worry, she, she did too, Oregon changed the law on um, the higher scheduled drugs to make basically everything a misdemeanor. And she said, now I don't have uh, the, the stick. I only have a carrot. Yeah. And when I had the stick, I could say, you know, if, if you don't participate, then there's the door to the jail again. Yeah. And they basically took that away from me. And she was really not supportive of that concept at all. But we like to uh, do things differently in, uh, in Oregon. And, uh, and you know what? It helps the clinicians when someone else has the sticks because then we get to then our then our job is to work with the patient to con, con, basically conform to the rules that someone else has set, and we don't right. have to get in struggles with them right. over setting. Right, that's not the, your issue. Yeah. Anyway, we're like the pro, anti uh, vaccination protesters in the hearing I just left. Mm -hmm. I'm not chairman. Not my issue <laughs> to deal with crowd control anymore. That's a tough one. Um, Say it. <laughs> Have fun, Frank. <laughs> uh, so, great. So we're at, I uh, know you have to um, get going soon. And uh, so we have about five minutes for, for Q&A. Sure. Um, sir? I think they're going to bring a mic Oh, I'm sorry. Too. Did you? No, just, no. Okay. I didn't want him to start until he had a mic. Thanks. Hey, Sally. Uh, Jacob Rich, Reason Foundation. Oh, I didn't so Representative Walden. Um, I want to ask you about um, some legislation that did not make it out of committee. One of the bills at the end of your final hearing sought to expand buprenorphine prescribing to physician's assistants and nurse practitioners. But there was some concern from the DEA that that might be problematic and there might be some issues with buprenorphine getting out. So um, I do respect the DEA's concern there, but I'm just curious in regards to what France did, basically removing licensing requirements for any doctors to prescribe buprenorphine and no issue of buprenorphine in France that I've seen, why shouldn't the U.S. go mm -hmm. forward and just remove the we licensing know that requirement in general? Too, right? like yes, also, yes, yes, yes. We, we greatly expanded those. And you did two expand things. it to 275. Yeah, so yes. um, we're, not, we're not France, love France. Um, but 
we're not. And it was actually a big fight to expand it out to the level that we did. We, we, we were out to, uh, I believe, nurse midwives. Is that right, Buck? Do you remember how far out? And I'll tell you, the physicians on the community were none too happy with me or that for getting that far out there. there there's a training requirement. But look, Suboxone, um, there, are, there are instances in the U.S. where Suboxone is out being traded in the market as well and abused. Um, you do need to have some medical supervision uh, over its administration um, that's important. And I, I felt like we found a sweet spot. We dramatically expanded those that can oversee it. We, demand, we expanded the number of patients any particular provider could oversee. But again, you're prescribing a, a pretty potent uh, drug here. And uh, I would defer to the, the doctor, um, but, but I, think, I think we found the right place for now. Um, I do, I, I am, and I'm going to meet with Scott Gottlieb later today or tomorrow, but um, on naloxone, which is the antidote, He's working very aggressively to make that available basically over the counter, um, which is tremendous because there are, I believe, no proven side effects for administering it when it's not needed. And we know it saves lives. Um, and so uh, I, I think that's, that's yeah. good. Did I, did I get the yeah, Suboxone got that right suboxone. there um, from a uh, doctor's perspective? Yes. Actually, can I add something to your Please do. Reply? Um, you know, the, the paradox that, that Jason is referring to, I think, is that I can prescribe um, yeah, opioids. Yeah, yeah, all other kinds of opioids um, with higher, in some ways, higher abuse potential right. than even buprenorphine, and yet I need this right. eight hour. However, I'm very much in favor of it, but not because, it, not because of the potency of the medication, as in it's more dangerous, even though it's diverted beyond belief. Um, but because of the population you're dealing with, uh, because you're dealing with an extremely difficult group of patients, and for anyone to think that these medications are enough is one of the, I think at initially, a few years ago, it was one of the <laughs> kind of the biggest uh, misconceptions about MAT, this idea that you can just give someone methadone or just buprenorphine, and then as if it were, I mean, there are a lot of, frankly, a lot of sloganism in my field, and one of them is addiction is a disease like any other. It's not a disease like any other. It's not a disease where you give someone the medication and come back next week. There's a lot, there's so much personal work to do, so much rehabilitation, so much, I mean, and it can take years, frankly, although you don't need the intensive treatment that, for that long. But So I'm in favor of that certification, but more because of what this population of, of addicted people need than how to prescribe it. Um, so, uh, this lady, we'll get, we can get to everyone, I think. Can you stay an extra two minutes or something? Thank you. Uh, my name is Chelsea Ceruzzo. I'm a reporter with Inside Health Policy. Oh, yes. um, you touched upon this earlier. Um, last year, you co-sponsored a bill to align Part 2 with HIPAA. Are there plans to reintroduce the bill? And if so, um, how do you think it'll fare this Congress? That's a good question. Um, I don't know that we have an immediate plan to reintroduce, but it is a, a cutting room floor <laughs> uh, left behind that needs to be picked up and, and taken up again. The, the trouble we might have this time, and I don't want to prejudge, but <clears throat> Frank Pallone, the now chairman of the committee, was um, very much opposed to, to our change in, in part two and, and opposed it on the House floor. Now, uh, now Speaker Pelosi voted for it, and Steny Hoyer voted for it. In fact, I think most of their leadership voted for it, and I think there were, as I say, only 40 or 50 or 60 no votes on the floor once we had the, the full argument there. So I don't know if Chairman Pallone's views on it have changed, but obviously, um, you know, when I was chairman, the bills probably didn't move through the committee I didn't support, um, and I would assume he has a similar sort of view. But I, I hope we can work with him on it. I think it's really important. Um, there were not that many no votes in the committee, as I recall, and there were lots of advocates. And, and so hopefully moving forward we can address it because, again, um, it's the thing I heard more than almost anything else as I went around the... The, the treatment community, they said, you got to fix this because we don't know when somebody comes in if they're on, on treatment unless they tell us, then we got to get permission every step of the way. And then we had examples where people had died because <coughs> they'd gotten the wrong drugs that they shouldn't have had. So we're going to work on it. 
<clears throat> but I, I think that's one we're going to have to work a little harder on um, out of the gates. Okay, there's that lady, this gentleman, and then there was one gentleman back there. Okay, and then. Hi, I'm Emily Madden. I'm a researcher and statistician with HHS. Oh, um, two quick questions, if you don't mind. First, are you aware of the changes to part two that have just became final that SAMHSA put out that does address a lot of the information sharing with providers? Not in great detail, but does it completely waive the requirement that the, the as long as a consent to, form is signed, then they can share for treatment, they can share for um, Right, payment. but does it still require at each step you have to sign that consent? No, not at each step. And they're still finalizing so some of it, but SAMHSA has put right. forth a final rule that right. does address some of that that may be Good. worth looking into. We'll take a look at it, yeah. And then going back to Matt just quickly, um, have you thought of anything to address the issue that many recovery houses and programs that help people struggling with addiction don't allow people to be on MAT? They don't allow them to be on buprenorphine or any of those drugs if they want to reside in those houses? Um, no, but these are the sorts of... Whenever we take on a major piece of legislation, then when you come back and you go, here's the next three things you didn't take up, that sounds like one of them we should go look at. Um, I visited a number of treatment homes, um, some related to veterans, some others, um, and, and I know they have strict rules uh, about their operations, but you would think they would, uh, I, maybe they're, are they concerned about a diversion or something of, of Suboxone, you think? Oh, okay. So you got to be completely, yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll flag that, Buck, make sure we get that down. Thank you for raising that, and I'll, we'll look at the SAMHSA information as well. If they can handle it regulatorily, yeah, it's a lot easier. Yeah. Gentlemen. Hi, good morning. Um, good morning. My name is Andre Pellegrini. I'm the director of finance for the largest substance abuse clinic in Maryland. We see 2,500 patients every day for methadone and buprenorphine. Um, most of our patients are Medicaid patients, and we have a few Medicare patients. Medicare will start paying for opioid treatment uh, back now in 2020. But there are some states uh, that do not, whose uh, Medicaid agencies do not cover for medication-assisted treatment, maybe four or five states in the country. Does the Support Act address those states, or is there anything that you guys, how would you guys work with these states to have them um, covering for medication-assisted treatment? Um, yeah, that's a good question. The, a lot of this, you know, we, we believe in letting states you know, run their programs. Um, you would hope they would see at the state level the savings that could be achieved for their overall health care programs if they took care of people who were seeking assistance. I mean, it's not cheap, certainly, but it's a lot less expensive than what happens if, for, if you get denied access to care. Mm -hmm. And so um, we haven't looked at sort of mandating it. Um, I suppose that's something you could do in Medicaid, um, but that, that might raise some, some issues. But, but you would hope they would just understand the common sense of it, that, that people, because now you're talking about somebody who's actually seeking help mm -hmm. and wants to get off the, the, the train of addiction. Yeah, follow up. Can I ask one more yeah, question? Sure. Okay, so um, a, lot of, well, a lot of what happened with the opioid epidemic was like, um, misleading marketing tactics from pharmaceutical companies, mostly uh, Purdue Pharma when he was marketing Oxy. And uh, it was this, like sales rep were actually telling doctors that, oh no, Oxy is not addictive. You can prescribe as, as much as you want to your patients and will, they will never get addicted. And today, of course, we know that was a lie. Does this support act address that? I don't think directly. Um we had an ongoing investigation, including Purdue Pharma, and our investigators were able to pierce the uh, protective shield around their settlement documents and have now read those. We cannot disclose those as part of the agreement, but we got to see the inside of what was going on. Um, and, and that was part of our final report that, that the doctor recommend, or referenced, which, by the way, you can find on the Energy and Commerce website. now. You have to go clear to the bottom of the page, pass the credits for who created the website, and you'll find the link to the Republican Energy and Commerce website. Now, this is what happens when you go in the minority. Yeah, it sucks. Um, <laughs> but, but 
part of it is looking at, um, at, at the marketing, I think. We have to. Um, Department of Justice has. There's been, civil, there's been state litigation on this matter. They've had settlements. Um, and, and if they misled, then they should be held accountable, period. Um, because lives were lost, communities have been destroyed. And this isn't like a one-day event. It's not like, you know, you got really drunk one night, you know, and had a bad next morning. Um, this is a lifelong well, implication. It, it appears that way, doesn't it? And so um, that, that holds a, 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 a more uh, a hotter place in hell for people to do that. Can you take one more? Yeah. Already have to go. One more. Okay, Jordan this. says I can take one more. Okay, this lady. <laughs> Good morning. Morning. I'm Georgia Stock. I'm a intern on the Hill. Um, and I just have a question for the future. So what future legislation or ideas do you have about combating and evolving the opioid crisis, particularly like looking at non-opiate alternatives that can, yeah. you know, do the same thing? Because I know that um, from constituents in the office that I work in, they find it very hard if you know they request a non-opiate alternative to get coverage for that, particularly with Medicare Part D, because the it's they make it so strict on what can be, you know, criteria and you know long-term solution if non-opiate alternatives are part of those yeah. programs, it would also you know save a lot of money because opiates are way more expensive to for yeah. prescriptions. Re really good question. Um, so a couple things we had a part of of the Support Act has a provision to encourage research into non-addictive pain treatment, which has always been the, what we thought we had. Yeah. Um, and, and some people maybe knew or didn't know. Um, and so that's part of the research piece. The second piece is the long-term efficacy of the drug. There, I, I, I think it was a, a VA study, Veterans Affairs uh, uh, Community Study, that I recall it right, showed basically people who had been on, I'll say, Tylenol, long-term, had better pain relief over long-term than people who went on opioids. In their study, if I, if I recall it correctly, maybe some of you have read that too. And, and it's because your body needs more and more and more and more uh, of the opioid. Um, now look, there, there are places where opioids are the perfect drug. Stage four bone cancer, I mean, the, 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 again, I won't practice medicine here. But it, perhaps there are other pain alternatives. I, I was at a, a round table in my district with a, a doctor who's been a real leader on this, and we do a lot of this in Oregon. And they're studying whether even things like yoga and other sorts of activities like that produce a similar sort of effect rather than going down the drug path. Yeah. Well, that's the accent. <laughs> Off-label or something. Yeah. Gabapentin. Well, these are the things we should look at. I think the goal is... How do we get the pain relief people need without all the side detriments, right? How do you, how do you get them something that, that takes care of the pain without hooking them and, and making matters worse? And, and again, for some, these are the best drugs on the market, and they work long term for people. And we, I tried to steer a really careful course so we didn't just obliterate the prescribing of opioids because people need these drugs. Um, but also to stop overprescribing. There's no reason you go home with a bottle of pills like this when you got a wisdom tooth pulled or something. You know, and so I think it was a wake up call. And I talked to a lot of physicians along the way who said, frankly, in med school, I never got trained on this. It was like 10 minutes, you know, boom, done. And they get patients that come in and go, ah, oh, nothing else works, doc. I'm in all this pain. You got to help me. I've had, and it's like, okay, because there's no real, there's no, blood pressure cuff they put on or something under your tongue to take your temperature to see your pain level. So they're trusting the patients. But we can shut down through PDMPs 
you know, doc shopping, pharmacy shopping. We empower pharmacists in this. Buddy Carter, America's only pharmacist in Congress, um, made a big push. Give the pharmacists a role, because that's what they're seeing these patients when they come to the counter. And we, we actually put some pretty strong provisions there on, on pharmacists having a role. They're a part of this health care chain. So we tried, but, but to some of these points, there's more work to be done. That's why we need to do the review. What did we get right? What did we get wrong? So. Well, thank you so much for your leadership on this and for coming Thanks, here Doc. today. Yep. Good. Good to be with you all. Thank you. Come back next year. I'll okay. come back Thanks. next year. Okay. Um, come on up. I'm supposed to have two more chairs, which are coming right now. Okay. Oops. Okay, so I am going to give, whoops, a, uh, just to save time, a briefest of, of introductions, and um, you can read, of course, online uh, much more about the exploits of my co esteemed colleagues. First is Mayor Steve Williams, who was elected as Huntington, West Virginia's mayor in 2012, and I'm just going to summarize and say he's done spectacular work, which he will tell you about in, in terms of uh, rising to this incredible challenge in coordinating services at the local level. And next is Dr. Joe Parks. When I looked you up, um, I, I, there's a wrestler with your name, so you're, um, <laughs> you whose who's, who's nickname is The Abyss. So. <laughs> you don't look like that, but uh, anyway, you are the... Uh, <laughs> Uh, you are a, a psychiatrist and the medical director uh, of the National Council for Behavioral Health, which is a 3,000-member organization. And he still sees uh, patients in Missouri. And then my colleague, Alex Brill, who uh, studies economic and political consequences of health care. And um, he's going to present some of his original research here. So my first, um, my first question is just, um, I'm going to start with you down there, is um, just free associate to uh, what, what, we dis what I discussed with, doc uh, with uh, Representative Walden. What the congressman pointed out with the CARE Act, the 21st Century Cures Act, were much needed and highly welcome. Um, they started providing resources uh, to the states, and some of, it is, some of it is trickling down to the local level. That's what concerns us in the communities, is that it's not really trickling down. Um, some of us mayors have come up to the Hill to meet with members of Congress and, and encourage to be considering, at the very least, something along uh, the line of block grants. Our, our point has been, you've done this before for so many other things and to address poverty in, in communities and such. You don't have to reinvent the wheel uh, through block grants. Get money um, to the laboratories of innovation. And it's not state government. Municipal governments are the laboratory of, of innovation. Um, and what we end up finding, because we have to address it every single day, we have no choice but to act on it. And as a result of that, I'm a big uh, proponent of the smaller towns. Huntington is just about 50,000 people, not even at, at that point. But I, I keep pointing out that we will identify sooner what works, faster what doesn't, and quicker how to fix it. And then once we do that, then take that to the larger uh, cities. So um, what, what they have done is absolutely necessary. There's much more to do. Um, but uh, we really need, I believe, to find a way to, in getting the money to the states, make sure that it's getting to where, uh, where the problems really are, and that's in the local communities. Um, Dr. Parks? 
You know, I, I certainly agree that the, uh, the opening federal actions and the funding that's been has been a great first shot in the first battle of what's going to be a very long war. And what wins a war isn't your first shot. It's how long you can sustain that effort over time. And that is the sh that's where we are right now. This is temporary funding that goes away. These are relapsing illnesses. It takes three to five years if someone does real well to get them solid in recovery from an addiction, and we have one to two years of funding. Why would we expect anyone to get well and stay well? Right. It just takes longer. You can't, our members all operate treatment centers. They operate businesses. And you can't add a clinic. You can't add 10 staff on one-year funding. You can't take 200 new patients for a three to five year course of treatment when you have one year of funding. We need a sustainable ongoing resource because it's gonna take a good 10 years to really clean this problem up. It's gonna take three to five to make significant headway on it. You know, there was one other bill I wish I had a chance to thank uh, Representative Walden for that also has done tremendous amount in the uh, battle against opiates and that's the Excellence Act which established certified community behavioral health centers in eight states. And these are community health centers that are required to offer a treatment for addiction. 87% of them offer medication-assisted treatment. Just this limited startup has added 400 addiction treatment professionals in the states where they're operating. But like the other money, this is temporary money. And this project will wind down later this year unless subsequent legislation pending right now passes to extend and expand it. Really, this is something all states should have. This is care that's data-driven. They use data analytics to see who needs treatment and make sure that treatment doesn't have gaps occurring in it. And it's not freestanding. There was, the one other thing that resonated with me was the problem mentioned with freestanding residential treatment centers, where you're in, and when we're done with you, we're done. That is not helpful. These are centers that have full crisis services. They will see you as long as you have the illness. That's what curing addiction means. Yeah, I thought the, uh, uh, that Congressman Walden did a, did a great job. I mean, my takeaway is one, that, you know, first of all, the fact that there's, um, and he, he emphasized this right from the start, that it's been a bipartisan effort. Um, and in, in, in this town, uh, at least recently, we've seen few of those. And I think that you know, speaks um, both to, to how he's pushed this legislation through the, his committee when he, when he chaired it previously, um, but also just the nature uh, of the epidemic and the understanding by uh, members of Congress on a bipartisan basis of, of the severity of it. Um, and, and then the other part that really struck me is, is how, how many small solutions there are. Um, it, both in what he's done um, and, 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 and in what is needed to address this problem. Um, you both mentioned you know, the need for, for dollars, and dollars are obviously a big piece of this. Um, um, but there are other parts of it that are, that are critical as well, and, and, and uh, Congressman Walden talked about those, whether it's the changes at the FDA or otherwise. And, uh, and then finally, you know, his, uh, his admission that um, the bill, these bills may not be perfect, maybe because the funding is temporary or maybe because of other reasons and the need to review yeah. and, and continue on. Yeah. Um, Mayor, can you tell us a bit about um, just what it's like on the ground now and, and maybe where it was five years ago? Uh, <clears throat> I assume there's this time, a lot has happened in five years. Oh, and I for, forgive me, I forgot to mention that you organized the first uh, task force on... Uh, uh, we created Office yeah, of Drug Control. Yeah, we yeah. created our own Office of Drug Control yeah. Policy. Um, you know, it's we didn't spend any more money. We just repurposed people. One thing that I started finding in smaller c communities, uh, the congressman was mentioning a, a town of 400 people. What resources do they have? Some would say a town of 50,000 people. What resources would we have? Uh, one thing that I've learned not just in Appalachia, but everywhere in the nation. We have resources hiding in plain sight and talent hiding in plain sight. We, we just repurposed the resources that we already had and individuals who were already doing it. I had a fire, a, a fire captain, captain in our fire department, now is a, a chief of our fire, 
fire department, but she was also a registered nurse. Yeah. She came in to be part of what, of what we were doing. I had a crime analyst in the, in the police department was able to look at data and make it come alive as to actually what was happening on the ground. And then I had a, a retired police officer. And those three came together. Um, five years ago, you didn't have a lot of communities that were acknowledging that there was a problem. Um, I believe that the reason that my city became known as the epicenter of the epidemic was simply because we named the problem. I have a, I believe in a maxim is that you name it, then you can own it. You have to state it first. And what was happening in our community, it would have been very, very easy for me just to say, well, that's just a police problem. And I tried to say that at first. Uh, and, but it just kept growing and kept growing. Um, I came to understand that, as I said, you name it, you own it. Acknowledge the brutal facts. Have an unending faith in your ability to prevail, though. So five years ago, it was very easy for communities to say, we don't have a problem. You know why? Because they'd look at the data from the Centers for Disease Control, and the data was two years old. So it hasn't hit our community yet. Now, Dr. Sattel pointed out in our community in 2016, in August, one afternoon, we had 28 overdoses. Two people died because when they shot up, uh, they were alone. 26 people lived because every one of our first responders are equipped with a naloxone. Every one. So every one of them were saved. Um, but if we were depending upon the Centers for Disease Control, we would have only learned this last October that fentanyl had actually hit our community. Two years later. Now, now just think of it this way. It's wonderful to say this at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, I came from a background of uh, investment banking and, uh, and finance in the brokerage industry. Our financial system in in our nation relies upon the largest companies and most profitable companies in the world every quarter have to give an earnings report. Yet we depend upon our health system to tell us every two years the data that of, of what is happening within our, within our community. So what we ended up finding that we had to do is we had to have real-time data. Mm -hmm. Our police chiefs, our police chief would go visiting somewhere else and they're and be a chief somewhere else, kind of self-righteously, well, we don't have that problem in our community. So we'd ask them, so how many overdoses did you have last month? How many calls have you had? And at what level of death is occurring? Well, they didn't have any of that data because they weren't in collecting it. So the way you owned it is you measured it. Yes, yes. And that you have is to beautiful. exactly. And what we started seeing is what was there, but that's when people were saying, well, there's the epicenter of the epidemic. Now, I'm pleased to say with all that we've done in our community is that uh, now we're becoming acknowledged as the epicenter of the solution. Mm -hmm. This small town made sure that everybody understood they had an assignment. Everybody, ha everybody has to take part in the recovery effort, in the prevention, in the intervention, mm -hmm. in the treatment, in the law enforcement, everybody. Churches, businesses, elementary schools, hospitals, everybody, everybody has to take a, a role in, in that. So five years ago, nothing much was happening because people weren't seeing it. Right now, it's just staring everybody straight in the face. There were folks that were saying to me, I'm from Appalachian. There's just some things you just don't talk about in public and this is family stuff, and we just don't acknowledge these things. We don't talk about it in polite company. We have to talk about it. Everybody is, is dealing with it. Um, yes, it is big in West Virginia, but it's big in Chicago. It's big in Oregon. It's big right here in D.C. And what we have to, to do among the leaders is simply to acknowledge one thing. We have an obligation to lead. It starts there, and then everything else starts to fall into place. Dr. Park, what are you, what are you hearing from your, the members in terms of what they want from the, from the feds? 
You know, what we hear from our members is demand for treatment is out the roof. And they are struggling to get the staff on board and keep the staff on board and get them trained to provide all this treatment that's wanted and needed in their community. And uh, part of the issue is that in many cases, whether it's Medicaid or commercial insurance, the rates paid for substance addiction treatment is less than the actual cost of providing care. And it's interesting, because when you set a managed care company's rates, you're required to make them actuarially sound. The rate has to be calculated to cover the actual cost of care. But the same thing doesn't happen when the rate is set to pay the provider. It's often below the actual cost of care, and there's no requirement that the rate be set to cover the cost of care, which makes it hard to do high quality care. Our members are competing with Burger King and McDonald's to get their frontline staff to train. And they often have to subsidize addiction treatment out of other business lines. Uh, they give it at a loss. Uh, so one thing they need is rates that are adequate for the cost of care. The other thing they need is ongoing funding. If the federal government can only spend $5 billion, we would rather get $1 billion over five years than $5 billion in one year. It's hard to do anything good with money that shows up suddenly and goes away suddenly. And the state can't put out the contracts. If it goes through the state, state procurement laws are such that they'll take six months to get the money down to us. I'm sure you get that yep. in the counties, yep. too. Yeah. And, Doctor, you would also acknowledge, yes, you have to, obviously, you have to be able to pay for it. The, but the treatment has to be made available. Yes. When someone is saying, I'm ready for treatment, they can't wait six months or that, six weeks or six days. Within six hours, they need to be able to be placed in treatment right then. And a lot of our providers are actually converting their scheduling, so it's what they call same day or open access. So they're able to take and not say, well, call back in three weeks, you're on the waiting list, because you know they'll be busy getting high. Else, one of the things that was so sad of the 26 people who did live, there was one lady who realized, I need help. Six weeks later, she got word that she was accepted into a Suboxone treatment program. If you'd she had died a certified two, she, community She paper. died two days oh. earlier. Six months later, her family got word that she was accepted into a treatment program. And they said, well, she died. It was in February. She died in September. If, if there had been certified community behavioral yes. health center in West Virginia, like those eight other states, they're required to have 24-7 crisis services, they're required to have immediate access, they're required to do MAT. This is a program that's saving lives where it is. It needs to be more places. Oh, <clears throat> that's a lot of human, human cost, and incalculable human cost, but there is some calculable real cost. And, mm. and I'm just turn it over to Alex. Um, who's done a lot of work uh, on that issue, is how much this is costing. So you thought we weren't going to show any PowerPoint, but there you go. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, just as you described, Sally, uh, uh, I think that, that this chart uh, is, a, is a complement, in a sense, to the, the real human stories, which are, in many respects, more important and, and certainly more powerful. But I think that, um, that there's a value and an opportunity in thinking about this from a data-driven perspective and an analytical perspective. Um, economists who've studied the opioid crisis have put price tags associated with the, with the cost of that crisis, um, this crisis. Uh, generally speaking, in, in two regards. They think about uh, what we call the fatal costs and the non-fatal costs. And the non-fatal costs um, is, is sort of the more frequent way of looking at these problems. And what we're talking about here is What's the cost associated with, um, with the healthcare-related costs, emergency room visits, the criminal justice-related costs, and uh, the lost productivity? Uh, worker, uh, workers who are either high and not working or in treatment and not working, unable to work, um, who aren't earning income, who's, who therefore aren't producing output. Um, these are sort of three, three categories of costs that we can think of um, in a very hard way. Um, and then the fourth way is we can think about the, the cost associated with the loss of life. And that's sort of a, a, a hard thing to wrap your head around that concept, but, but economists have done it and they use it oftentimes in cost benefit analyses of various regulations and things. Um, the White House, um, in their efforts to promote a uh, legislative effort over the last few years, um, did a report uh, in 2017 on the economic cost of the opioid crisis. 
And the headline that came out of that study was that it was $504 billion. And they looked at the cost, and to, to your point, Mayor, about the lags in the data, they were looking at the deaths that had occurred in 2015, yeah. right? And now we're here, we're in 2019, and I'm talking about this report from 2017 and numbers that it relied on from 2015. But they, they counted up those deaths, and they counted up the, the addiction and the, and the lost work, and they came up with that total number. Now, most of that number um, is, the loss, is the cost associated with the loss of life. I just want to focus for a minute on, this, on the smaller piece of this, and know, which is what we call the non-fatal costs, healthcare, criminal justice, and, and lost wages or lost uh, productivity. That's about, in, again, going back years now, um, about uh, $78 billion, they estimate. And I should note that uh, you know, the number of deaths in, in this epidemic has gotten worse. So these numbers are, are in many respects, uh, underestimates. Um, and, and I think that that number um, helped motivate um, policymakers and, and, and helped drive the conversation forward and towards action. But I also think that, one, that's a number, $78 billion, that few, if any of us, can really wrap our heads around. What, what is that number? What is $78 billion? It's sort of too large to relate to. And then the second uh, thing that I think is important is a lot of policymakers want to know where. Where is that $78 billion in cost falling? Where specifically? Where on this map? Um, and so working with a colleague of mine here at AEI, Scott Gans, um, we, um, uh, we developed a methodology to distribute that number, both the, the larger $500 billion number and the $78 um, uh, billion number, um, to distribute it across the states based on data we knew about the states based on where the deaths were occurring, based on the cost of health care. The cost of health care is much higher in California than it is in West Virginia, based on variations in, in workers' incomes. So this is the map. This is the map of the, the, non, the distribution of non-fatal costs um, by states. And you can see you know, that there, there's five colors here, and so we broke it up um, into the highest and lowest per capita cost. So we, we divide the cost by the population in the state. And obviously, um, you can see... Um, uh, you can see where the, where the costs are falling, and they, they reach up to, uh, who's good at reading small numbers? Um, 360. 360. Um, and we can pick on Oregon um, as an example, um, just uh, because the congressman was here a moment ago. And, if I, and the way this map works is if you click on Oregon, as my colleague in the AV department is doing right now, <laughs> um, we're going we're gonna to zoom in on Oregon here, and it's going to break down um, beyond the state level um, going to break down to the county level. Um, and so um, I need to sort of caveat these numbers, which is that they're estimates. Um, and sometimes we have missing data, and we need to, uh, to impute those missing data. Um, but these are the best numbers, I think, that we have that tell us where these costs fall. Click. Can you do West Virginia? There we Virginia? go. Yeah. 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 Uh, we should be able to do West Virginia in a minute, too. And you can see that you know, the congressman represents the eastern part of the state as one of the largest districts. And we're seeing um, various... Um, costs um, you know, varying by county based on, on what the costs are and the number of, of uh, cases of addiction that we see in the states. We can try to do West Virginia, too. We're going to zoom out. We're going to click on West Virginia. We see the total costs on average in the state is uh, over $200 per capita. And uh, Derek clicks on the state of West Virginia. He crosses his fingers. <laughs> it's coming in a second. We're going to reload this. This, uh, let me just say uh, for, for a moment, this is part of a, so this paper that, that I'm describing, these numbers, um, we released these uh, roughly a year ago for the first time. Um, what we're in the middle of now is re-releasing these numbers um, and making them more accessible. And this goes to, to some of the things we were talking about, both when the congressman was here and, and a moment ago, about letting local public officials find out what's going on. What's your, yeah, what's the county? That's it. Where he is right there now. There we are. Uh, Cabell County, the non-fatality costs are uh, 391, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and it's one of the highest in the state. Yeah. Right? So this sort of this data uh, yeah, we comports. Had, we had in our as we started analyzing this, and it goes well beyond the healthcare costs, as you're saying. But we had determined that our cost per year was 100 million dollars per year on healthcare costs, just dealing with hepatitis. A, B, and C, endocarditis, and, and those related uh, health care costs, $100 million a year. 
It's a huge number. And you raise a good point, which is how do we capture all of the related healthcare costs? Um, or should we th be thinking about just the emergency room visits, or should we be really? We should really be thinking more broadly. We should be capturing uh, other diseases that are endocarditis, exactly HIV. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure that these that these numbers um, adequately capture all of the costs that we should be concerned about. But there, but it does also go into uh, workforce. You know, just just the loss of product and productivity. Yeah. Of what of, of what that does, as you indicated, these individuals might five ten years it take for them to be able to recover. But I would suggest not just those who are fighting addiction, but the children who are in an addicted environment. The effect that it's having there. We're looking. I'm convinced we're looking at the next two generations. It's already affected two. I think we're looking thirty to fifty <coughs> years on down the line that uh, we're going to be and, dealing with those costs. And not reflected in these numbers, but other research that other scholars are engaged in now are trying to capture those issues, um, uh, sort of a second generation effects, uh, mm -hmm. what, what effects it has um, in the household on, on, on the students, on the children of, of parents who are suffering from these addictions. Because we're seeing that children are born neonatal abstinence syndrome, being born exposed to substances. Um, but we're also finding that it's the, the children that are just living in that environment. But there's another area that we have just come upon that has been totally ignored of the first responders and those people who are dealing with the trauma of actually having to help the helpers, yeah. is that our first responders, teachers, medical personnel, in dealing with that, the level of stress that they're having to, to deal with ranks right up there with the very same problems or similar problems that those who are fighting the disease are having to, mm -hmm. to, to deal with as well. And you mentioned the, the costs, especially the health care costs. And I imagine that uh, uh, HIV and hepatitis C are only going to go up. And um, I know, Mayor, you have a needle exchange. And uh, just 40 miles away, I think, in Charleston, there is no needle exchange. So how did you manage to uh, do um, this in a pretty conservative place? Well, we were the first in the state of West Virginia to create the syringe exchange program. Um, honestly, when they first came to me well, with it, I was going, please, let's not go with this right now. We're trying to get, trying to get moving forward on our, our program. And as we were out talking within the community, the community reached down and said, this is something that we have to do. Our county health department uh, took a very active role in this. And as a result, Charleston and its county, Kanawha County, uh, began a, a syringe exchange program as well. Uh, there's a formula that works in dealing not just with uh, addiction, but also, I think, just deals with community involvement, is that uh, if, you, if you actually create conversation and you're communicating with one another, that leads to, to partnerships. Um, those partnerships then start to establish trust. Then you have hope as an outcome, not as a tactic, as, as an outcome. Well, simply the fact that we were talking to one another, um, when our law enforcement agencies were concerned that there seemed to be an increase in... Um, in needle litter, um, rather than just saying this needs to be shut down, the health department that was dealing with the syringe exchange program and our command staff of the police department, they came together and talked. Imagine, they collaborated with, with one another. And once collaboration occurred, then they started figuring out and looking at it from each other's perspective, not just trying to drive their thought with them. The reason that we were able to continue it on, the, the media tried to pull us into it, and we stiff-armed them. We just weren't going to be in, drawn in, into that. It became just a horrible problem. Again, you remember earlier I said everybody has to accept an assignment? The beauty that, is, that has occurred in our community, it's not to say that there aren't those who aren't taking shots at what we're doing. Believe me, you go on social media, you know, I'm just, 
I'm, I'm, I'm getting hit from all, from all angles, but most of the community has taken on their assignments as to, to what to do, and as a result of, of that, uh, we've been able to withstand that resistance of shutting down syringe exchange program because that's the portal to recovery. Yeah, what's been right your experience there. with it as an engagement tool? Because the person they're that's exchanging the needles, they're saying, I got a problem here. Our members find that it is an excellent way to engage people over time and, and say, you ready to start treatment now? Is this the week you're that's ready? That's the trust that we're talking yeah. about. That's the trust that we're talking about. We've also created a quick response team when somebody overdoses, this is uh, through SAMHSA that we've been able to, to receive uh, help. Um, and that has been wonderful. 24 to 72 hours, somebody overdoses, then we have a, a counselor, a, a professional counselor. We have someone on the EMS team, our, one of our law enforcement officers. We also have clergy. We're the only community in the nation that includes clergy in this. They're not in there proselytizing and handing out little uh, <laughs> pamphlets. If somebody wants, is inclined towards a spiritual perspective, they're there to offer that help. If they, <laughs> they make it real clear, now don't go throwing this Jesus stuff at me, well, they'll just back off, and then they, but they're there to offer support to the other people in, in, in the team. But again, it's the collaboration, everybody talking to one another. That's why we've been able to, to withstand the assault, so to speak. And as a result of that, we are beginning to develop solutions at a level that uh, other communities across the country are just now starting to pick up. It just We've had the Surgeon General come in to look at what, we were, what we're doing to take it across the country. Uh, the director of the Centers for Disease Control visited us. Uh, the director of the National Office of Drug Control Policy came in to look at our, at our program. And uh, lastly, the ambassador to Great Britain from Great Britain came in to see uh, what we're doing. I've been invited to the uh, Cross Borders Foundation meeting with the, uh, with the Canadians to talk about uh, what we're doing. And that, again, it all starts with the collaboration. You know, one member of the community that I think isn't engaged enough are the payers. And those are big national members, the Medicaid agencies, the big insurance companies, and there's a ton a payer can do. I know, I used to be a payer. I was Medicaid director in Missouri, and we had tons of data that we were able to use to get at the opiate problem. We looked at all our claims, and we looked for the opiate prescribing patterns that are a red flag people going to multiple prescribers, multiple pharmacies, people with certain diagnoses for malingering or somatization, and you can make a risk score and identify people not that are certainly having an abuse or dependence problem, but might be. They look kind of, it, it makes you nervous. Then you can aggregate those around the doctors that see the greatest number of that kind of patient. A lot of those doctors don't know that. And we send them a report saying, Dr. Parks, mm -hmm. do you know that you're in the top 5% yeah. of Doctors seeing a whole bunch of patients with high risk or questionable patterns that makes it look like they may have trouble with opiates. Here's a list of them. Would you please think about that? And we saw some very nice reductions. And you know, some of those doctors, a couple of them were pill mills. We handed them over to our drug and dangerous. But some of them, they just had soft hearts. If somebody cried a lot in front of them, they couldn't say no. And the word gets out, and they didn't know they were outliers. They thought everybody was hanging out. That's one thing a payer can do. Another thing a payer can do, and there's three states where the Medicaid agency has just started paying for people in recovery from opiate addiction to work in emergency rooms to engage that person that just had the overdose. And somebody that has gotten out of an addiction has more credibility to say, you can get out too, than a doctor or mayor. You know, they, they think we got it easy. and you know, what do We know about being addicted, and they're right, you know? And this is a, a payer here came up with a new kind of provider in the emergency room just for this. We need to see that kind of involvement from the commercial companies, you know, from, from the big private insurers too. They can be creative and they need to be asked to be more creative and they need to be asked to share their data with cities like the mayors. And they can do it. It's not hard. I know. I've done it. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to ask, <clears throat> pardon me, the last question of... of uh, the mayor, and, and I bet you, something you'd like to weigh in on, Alex, which is the massive multi-district litigation that's um, 
about to, I guess in the fall maybe, they keep moving the date back, but I think about 1,500 uh, states, uh, counties, municipalities have sued uh, drug maker, opioid makers, and distributors, and some I think have CVS and Walgreens in there. But um, And you're part of that effort, mm -hmm. right? We're part yeah. of it, and we just got word a couple of weeks ago that uh, our trial will begin later this spring. Likely get pushed back a little bit, but our trial will begin this spring. I've got a little bit different take on, on, on the lawsuit and the outcome. Um, there are those, understandably, that are, that are, that are saying um, those distributors and those uh, pharma pharmaceutical uh, manufacturers, uh, they made this stuff, they created this problem, and let's just beat the living out of them. And you can put whatever is in, that <clears throat> in the middle there. Um, punish them. The, t the attorneys have come to me and said, so... Mayor, we need you to determine what the costs are and what the costs have been to, to your community. Frankly, I could give a flip about recovering our past costs. What is past has passed, P-A-S-S-E-D. That has passed. But I do want to make sure that we're prepared to handle what is coming in the future. As I was mentioning, I really believe the next 30 to 50 years are, are critical. I want us to be prepared to deal with the burden that has been placed on us for these next few decades, but I also want to make sure that we never ever go down this pathway again. Dr. Sattel, you were mentioning earlier, rather than it being an opioid epidemic, it is an epidemic, an epidemic of addiction, um, generally stated ad ad addiction. Um, what I'd love to be able to see, and I've been saying this and down in the Ohio River Valley where we're located, maybe now that I'm where the center of the world is, right here in Washington, maybe the word will, will get out. Uh, we have cancer institutes, we have Alzheimer institutes, we have diabetes institutes, we have enterprise institutes. I don't know, I will be corrected, but I don't know that there is a celebrated addiction institute, Institute, institute on Addiction, that studies addiction and identifies everything from chemically, what occurs uh, psychologically and, so, and sociologically, how it, how it occurs, what it ha the effect that it has on the, on the economy and, and such. I really believe that if we're going to do this, that we should partner with those distributors and those uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers to be investing in how do we address addiction, not to develop another pill, but how we might identify what is it that causes the addiction, and it's opioids and other things, but there's also tobacco and there's food and there's alcohol and there's just deal with addiction. We have one shot right now. We have one shot at this. The ball is coming across, and we have really one swing. If we miss it, then we all suffer. But we have the one opportunity to be able to knock it out of the, out of the park. And I really believe that if, as I've said, that we all identify what our assignments are on this, is that we insist that not only we're going to correct the systemic problem that gets us here, but how do we make sure that it doesn't happen again. That's what I believe that we need to take full advantage of the multi-district uh, lawsuit, litigation uh, suit, to make sure that we're uh, fixing the system and assuring that it never happens again in the future. I just, I just add very briefly, I mean, I, I, I think you make an excellent point about thinking about this problem from a, a prospective versus retrospective perspective, um, and that the litigation is is backwards looking and that the solutions need to be forward looking. Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't have a, a particular take on how that lit litigation is going to work out through the system. I, I do know that some of the attorneys have been interested in some of the maps that I've, that I've put up before as people try to understand once there's a, a bucket of, of resources that are available, how are we going to distribute those and who gets what? Yeah, how much uh, do the trial lawyers get? That's important. <laughs> well, and, and how much comes off the top is obviously um, uh, yeah. a piece of that. 
um, and that is, is undoubtedly fueling some of these efforts. But um, um, and so you know that process is ongoing. I think it'll it'll take some time for it to, to, to work itself out ultimately. This is a good time to. I was going to move on to. Did you we, did well, you I want just to, add to ask that? the yeah. economist because oh. you know part of this problem we got to because there was an economic incentive for the pharma companies to encourage not just appropriate use, but any use. So we actually have a purchasing pricing model where we incentivize them to behave in this manner. And how do we get at that? Why wouldn't they do it again eventually? Because the incentive's still there. If I have a drug that's available, I'm not paid just for appropriate use. I'm paid for any and all use. It happens with multiple drugs. And the same is true for physicians. Yes, absolutely. Right. Right. I mean, the physician is the one who's, who's writing the script. But we are getting more value-based purchasing where I'm going to get a haircut if my outcomes are bad and a bonus if my outcomes yeah. are good. And that's going to align. That is happening with fish. Yeah. And I, I haven't think that's, seen it yet with pharma. Well, it will align the incentives throughout the supply chain. If the, if the physician who's holding the pen has better incentives, then that should get it much better. Fifth better. vital sign doesn't help matters. You know, where you have to measure that, that pain, it's so subjective. So that individual is sitting and saying, I am in such pain, and then, all right, I'm going to give a ranking of, of zero mm -hmm. or whatever that is, so that my pain is still at this level, they haven't yeah. addressed the pain. Still, that's the systemic problem that we're yeah. part of the systemic problem. And to Dr. Parks' point, I mean, we had a, we had a system in Medicare where, where pain was a metric, and as we try to you get extra uh, for managing pain, and so people were, you know, hospitals at the hospital level were concerned about the reporting of pain um, uh, as patients left the hospital, um, that's, that's the inverse of the incentive we want to be creating. Yep. To just complicate all that, <clears throat> uh, yes, overprescribing, but now we have, you know, a generation of, you know, probably a relatively small subpopulation, but still a very real one of uh, people who have, you know, chronic pain. They've been on these medications at high doses because they've, you know, been tolerant over the years. So there's fairly high doses, but there, many of them are handling it well. That medication is helping them tremendously. And, uh, and they are kind of the dark side of the, the controls that properly are being put in place, because there's no question yeah. they've been overprescribed. Be but yeah, that is a massive, massive problem of, of chronic pain patients now who are, whose doctors are, are so nervous, largely because they've misinterpreted, they're well-meaning, but they've misinterpreted the CDC guidelines, which do not say to get people off these meds. But uh, So there's an effort to compensate there, too. So you have excesses on, on, on some level, and at the same time, an over overcorrection that's hurting people as well. So we're figuring it all out. I, I think everything is above the surface now in terms of what, what, what are the problems we have to deal with. So, um, so thank you all, and uh, let me ask folks here if they, if they have questions, sir. Uh, I'm Jim Berry, addiction oh, hey. psychiatrist at West Virginia University. Oh, yeah. Yep. Oh, thank you. Uh, Jim news. Berry, addiction psychiatrist, West Virginia University. Thank you so much. This has been such a treat just to hear uh, the discussion. One thing I thought I would hear more being at the American Enterprise Institute is something about jobs. And one of the uh, challenges that a number of my patients face is being able to get back into the workforce. And I always consider work good medicine among all the other medicines that I'm able to prescribe. But it's such a challenge for them to find jobs, one, if they have a criminal record, to be able to get back into work. Two, uh, finding a job that will allow them to do all the treatment necessary to be able to engage in that treatment and still work. There's some things that can be done in each community. Um, and down in southern West Virginia, you may have heard about it. It's the uh, um, Coalfield Development Corporation. I mean, some uh, young entrepreneurs came forward, and they, they had an idea that is unique to those of us who grew up in West Virginia, is that uh, when things supposedly are ready to be tossed away and thrown away, they found a way to repurpose them. And uh, it has to do with buildings, it has to do with machinery, it has identifying ways to repurpose them, but it also has an awful lot to do with people. And for individuals who are ready to be tossed away, uh, they have um, developed an untold number of companies, one of them being for out-of-work coal miners, also for those who are fighting uh, addiction, is they have, uh, particularly for the out-of-work coal miners, they have uh, 
train them to be uh, solar panel in installers. And uh, they've created a company called Solar Holler. <laughs> and they have uh, solar roofing uh, installations that, that are occurring. They've, they've trained over 800 people uh, to be certified for, for, other, for other jobs. And what was fascinating is that um, after we started the, uh, uh, the quick response team, folks from HHS came in to meet with us and we were talking in detail about what we've been able to, to do uh, with the quick response team. Um, one of the last, que the last question that came out, and I just wanted to just reach out and just hug this person, but in this day and time, I asked permission first. Um, I said, they, they said, so well, what are you doing for workforce development? Now, earlier when I said when you have collaboration leading to partnerships, establish trust, what's surprising in Huntington, in the midst of everything that we're going through, we're having more investment in our community than we've had in the last 50 years. You would think that having such a massive drug problem would just suck all of the energy out of the room. It's how a community responds. And what we're, what we're doing, the same people who are, are saying that I'm taking an assignment to start working to, 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 to fight this epidemic, we're having businesses that are coming forward in large measure because it's hit them right at home. They have seen the effects of someone uh, either in their family or a, a neighboring family, and they've said, all right, we're going to come in and we're going to begin employing these, these individuals. And it's a, I won't say they're, it's taking over the Chamber of Commerce, but the Chamber of Commerce is very active in, in this, and businesses are stepping in to identify ways. But lastly, it's even more reason why you have to have an acti active entrepreneurship program. Rather than training somebody to be able to get a job, maybe let's train folks so that they can create a job. Now, while these individuals are fighting addiction, if we're also training them how to be able to channel themselves to create their own problem, they have their own network. And what's fascinating in that network of recovery, of those individuals in recovery, they hold each other up. And where I'm starting to see those entre entrepreneurs, a lot of them um, are construction related, but that's the great opportunity that we have. But you're, but you're right. If, if we don't include workforce development and creating the opportunity to create jobs, then it's it, particularly in the poorer areas, less affluent areas, it's going to continue to go on because once you lose that hope, then everything else starts to erode. And I certainly agree. My patients, when somebody gets a job, I expect them to get significantly better over the next several months, and they almost always do. You know, this is another role where we need to expect more of our health care payers. Medicaid is the only coverage that will pay for the services to develop a job for a person that has an illness and to get them plugged in and then to support them long enough they, they can go on doing okay. Other coverage could do that, and it would save them more money than it costs them. It's one of the best things Medicaid does is support employment, developing jobs, and getting people in them. And, and, and the point that you make is an illness. Yes. Acknowledging that it's an illness. A few years ago, I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Now, there, once that word got out, my job wasn't in peril. It's your dessert. Good <laughs> yeah, thank Kevin. Um, but the, but, the, but the fact of the matter is that so many of us still see it as a moral failing. Once we make the switch to understand that we're dealing with a disease, and there, there are, we have individuals in my, I have individuals in my office that are dealing with other health care problems. I am not about to dismiss those individuals because they're missing work because that the, a chronic condition exists, uh, we still have an awful lot of work to do in that regard. One more question. Um, well, both of you both asked one before. I'm looking for someone who did not. Would that be you? No. Um, OK, can you do it fast? In which case, and, and if you can do it fast as well, ask yours, and you ask yours right after. And then 
Mine's relatively quick because I was just wondering if Joe Parks, you could just elaborate more on your point of um, the economic incentives on doctors and pharma companies that you briefly touched on because I will tend to agree that there is sort of an incentive when the doctor will become like a represent for a particular drug type that's hired by the company, like to speak on it, that it's great. It's not so much anymore because of obviously it's become more recognised, but historically that has been an issue and I know that there's no real, like with any kickback legislation, there's nothing that actually touches on that as an issue. Joe, hang on. Oh, yeah, can you, can you, okay, great. And, yeah. Zippy. JJ Rich, Reason Foundation. Um, Mayor Williams, you brought up the case against uh, distributors and manufacturers. Basically, the idea is that they cause addiction. If you look at NSDUH data, we see constant rates of addiction. And I'll admit that those data could possibly f be flawed, but um, I was curious if Alex Brill could maybe elaborate on the data that allowed you to produce the uh, cost from people not working because they're addicted and whether those show actual increases in addiction rates. Okay, you want to go with Mr. Dr. Parks first? Yeah. Uh, you know, doctors are like everybody else. We're susceptible to advertising and we can be persuaded. And even though we've been trained to read the literature, advertising still works. That's the way people are behaviorally. And the companies are very good at it. They actually have a treatment plan for each of us. I, in my, the, Drug reps that visit me have a profile of my past ways of decision making, of the previous conversations. They know what they're going to say to me, and they actually have data on everything I've prescribed. There you go. Uh, it is a huge investment on their part to influence my behavior uh, because that is the way they make their money, and it's hard to resist that. And when I'm not getting data from any place else, you know, who else is giving me data other than the rep? Who else is paying that much personal attention to how I think? And they are resourced and able to do that. And I don't think that doctors individually restraining themselves will adequately change the incentive of pharma companies to have their medications used beyond the appropriate limits. I just don't think it will be that powerful. I just add to, to your question. Well, let me first just say, I mean, there, there are rules, right? I mean, there, there are, the rules may not be working, right? Uh, yeah. But, but there, there are, it's not, uh, there it's are not rules. the wild. There are rules. It's not the Wild right. West, and right. it is much more restricted than and, it was and there, previously. And those rules are tighter, and there's reporting requirements around those things. Um, but to your question about the data, unfortunately, I don't have a really good answer because I haven't focused on the time series. I haven't looked at how these things have changed over time. This is the numbers that I presented are a snapshot in time. Um, future work may try to, to update those numbers, and then we could do comparisons over time. We could look at how the numbers are evolving as either the death rates are changing or costs in the system are changing, and, and that's something that's, that's But that is another data source for cities. The way pharmacy claims are adjudicated is when you get that filled, it is already paid for before you're out the door if you're covered by insurance and it's not cash. And there's already been a transaction between that pharmacy, the wholesaler, back to the manufacturer so they can get a rebate. And if it's Medicare or Medicaid, there's a transaction with the government. So all those parties know that pharmacy, that med is in your hand before you're out the door. And that's information he could use if it was made available to him. And it's there and it all happens in a millisecond of real time. In Missouri, as a payer, we would take the pharmacy transactions and put them on a website that a Medicaid physician had a secure login. I could log in and I could see all the meds my patient got for the last three years. And I tell you, I would see that before they got home from the pharmacy. The pharmacy part would be loaded because that's the only thing that happened in real time. We started doing this how long ago? 2004. It's possible. It just takes will or a mandate. Would you like to get the last word? I'm, I think I've had enough words. Yeah. <laughs> oh, all right, then. Well, I'll get the last word, which is thank you all so much for coming, and thank you for all your expertise and, and on the ground getting your hands dirty, which is really where it all is at the local level. Thank you so much. Thanks.